Good morning, and welcome to Mission of Grace Church. I'm Pastor David. We welcome you in the name of God our Father and His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, as you may know from today, we're one step closer to being in the building as I am in the building this morning. We're working towards in-person services. We presently have drive-in services each Sunday at 11 o'clock. We cordially invite you to those as well. We pray that um, your tuning in this morning would be beneficial to you spiritually, that you would be blessed by the hearing of the word and by worshiping God together. The psalmist writes this, Praise the Lord, praise, O servants of the Lord, praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore, from the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Let us pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning, grateful for your great grace to us, grateful that we have a day, one day in seven, to worship you together. And Father, we do not take it lightly, but we worship you together this morning or whenever it is we're watching we worship you together with all the saints, for your name is greatly to be praised. Help us to do that in our preaching, in our praying, in our singing, Lord, in our giving, in everything we do and say and think. May you be glorified in us. And Lord, we ask humbly that you would edify us, that you would sanctify us, that you would work in our hearts your grace and that we would grow in the grace and knowledge of you. These things we ask in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen.
Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus and to take him at his word just to rest upon his promise and to know thus saith the Lord Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust his cleansing. And in simple faith to plunge me neath the healing, cleansing flood. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I prove Him or endure. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus. Trust him more. Yes, tis sweet to trust in Jesus, just from sin and self to see, just from Jesus simply take life and rest and joy and peace Jesus, Jesus how I trust him how I prove him more and more Jesus, Jesus precious Jesus oh for grace trust him more Jesus Jesus how I trust him how I prove him more and more Jesus Jesus precious Jesus oh for grace to trust him more Trust him more. Join your hearts with mine, if you would, this morning as we pray to God for help in our time of need. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you as a people in need of your grace, in need of your mercy. Each day, Lord, your mercy is new. And indeed, we need fresh mercy each day. For each day we fail, each day we sin, each day we fall short of the glory of God. We pray, Lord, that you would help us and that our lives would be moving upward, closer to you, closer to one another, that you would help us during this difficult time, confusing time, troubling time, anxious hour. Father, that you would protect and preserve your church. That you would bring a soon end to this pandemic and that you would bring rest to our country that you would bring to our nation righteousness, Lord. Deliver us from the societal sins that have plagued us for decades. We pray, Lord, that there would be a new wave of righteous leadership. Lord, 
that more and more we would honor you in what we say and do and think. We pray, Lord, not only for our government, but our educational institutions and our churches, that, Lord, there would be a revival of Christ following. Father, may there be a great grace awakening. Lord, we pray for those who mourn. Please comfort them. For those who are sick, may you give them healing and help and strength. For those who are afraid, may you give them refuge and courage. And for those who are anxious, may you give them peace and security. And for those who are depressed, may you lift their hearts from the sadness and for those who are in harm's way, may you protect them, give them safety, Lord. May we love you each day even more. May we love one another more. May you help us stay the course, Lord. May you help us in our thinking, in our thought life, May you work in us grace into the center of our very beings. And may this word this morning be powerful as it is preached from these lips of clay. May it find ground, fertile ground, to receive the implanted word. And may there be growth, may there be encouragement, May there be edification. May there be sanctification. These things we pray in your great name. And all God's people said, Amen. Now it's time just to make mention of remembering for tithes and offerings. The needs of this church continue during this remote ministry. And there's a couple of ways that you can remember to give either by visiting our website, missionofgracechurch.org, or mailing directly to 358 Pleasant Street, Gardner, Massachusetts. sermon comes from Proverbs 4.23. Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. The Word of God. I Walk the Line is a song written and recorded in 1956 by the late Johnny Cash. He wrote it in 20 minutes. It was his first number one hit. And while he was performing the song, Cash told the audience with a smile that the humming he did before he sang the verses was necessary because the song changed keys five times. The song lyrics refer to marital fidelity and personal responsibility in avoiding temptation. It's based upon a freight train rhythm common in many of Cash's songs a haunting sound that he heard growing up. The first verse goes like this. I keep a close watch on this heart of mine. I keep my eyes wide open all the time. I keep the ends out for the tie that binds. Because you're mine, I walk the line. Do you keep a close watch on your own heart? God commands you, keep your heart with all vigilance, 
for from it flow the springs of life. Have you ever had a stress test? That's when the physician puts you under stress to test your heart. You may walk vigorously on a treadmill and the physician will check your heart for its response. Well, the great physician is giving us a stress test these days. The body has been placed under great stress by current events, and the Lord is checking our hearts for our response. People are ruminating like never before. They are isolated and alone in their thoughts. Communication is limited Yet information is exploding. Some of the information is misinformation, indeed disinformation. All the while, we're chewing the cud of our restless minds, which may end in great folly. It's probably not a time to make big decisions in your life. You may be deceived. You may be deceiving yourself. You may be led astray by your own heart. Whoever said, follow your heart, was a fool. I know of a guy who likes to post pictures of himself in the late 70s, in the 80s, on Facebook, doing stupid things. He captions them, what was I thinking? There is great regret when thoughts hijack our hearts, and lead us to do and say things that we only later realize were unwise. When Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? His answer showed where true Christian spirituality begins. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. The heart is central to the Christian faith. The word heart in the Bible is used to describe you within, you inside. The Bible refers to the word heart almost 1,000 times. It means the inner self. The heart has a crucial role in what we treasure and say and think. In our inner beauty, in repentance and faith, in our service, in our obedience, our covenant faithfulness, our worship, love, daily walk, and seeking of the Lord. For instance, we must seek the Lord with all of our heart. To draw near to God without our hearts is to fake devotion and is nothing but a mere sham. What is the heart? The world says it's just emotions, but it's much more than that. The heart is a comprehensive term that captures the totality and unity of our inner nature. It is the source of our motives, the seat of our passions, the center of our thought processes and springs of our consciences. It is the hidden control center in every person. From the heart flow the springs of life. What the physical heart is to the body for health, the spiritual heart is to the soul for holiness. As goes the heart, so goes the man. It is the helm of the ship. The heart is the mind, the desires, and the will. It includes what we know and think and imagine, what we love, want, and seek and yearn for, and what we choose, what we'll say yes to or no to. Aim straight for the heart, your mind, desires, and will. The heart is the governing center of every human being. Now, remember that Jesus Christ is our great prophet, priest, and king. And his threefold offices redeem our mind, 
desires and will from sin. Our mind, that is what we know, can be hijacked by sin, and so we fall short of what we know. Our great prophet teaches us and assures us our desires, what we love, can become twisted and perverted by our own iniquity. It is our great high priest who redeems and renews our desires. Our will, what we choose, can be in rebellion due to transgression. Yet our great king subdues us and strengthens us. Hallelujah. What a savior. John Flavel famously said that the greatest difficulty in conversion is to win the heart to God, and the greatest difficulty after conversion is to keep the heart with God. Keep your heart with all vigilance. Amid everything you are watching, by all means, watch your heart. Do not take your eyes off of it. To guard the heart is the great business of the Christian life. It is where you keep your treasure. Protect your treasury from robbery. The heart is the first order of business because everything begins here. If the reservoir is poisoned, so will be all the pipes and the faucets. All your thoughts and attitudes, wants, fears and resolutions are generated in your heart. All your words and actions are governed by your heart. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. As goes the heart, so goes the man. The heart is your last offense. With the soccer team, the last defense is the goalie, and that goal is called the keep. In a castle, the keep is the most strongly guarded place, a place of refuge in the castle. The heart is our keep. It's our last wall of defense in the fortress that's under perpetual attack. The world infiltrates. Satan seduces, the flesh frustrates, people mock, professors confuse us. The heart is under constant attack and in need of reinforcement. The Puritans taught that heart work is hard work. You can go to church and miss the point. You can go to a church that captivates you academically without any exhortation to heart work. They may make you think that you're superior when indeed your heart is imperiled and being let go. Or you can go to a church that works up your emotions so that you follow your feelings. Feelings are deceiving. Indeed, we walk by faith and not by sight or titillation. The counsel of our verse is wise and very opposite to the wisdom of our age. We're told today that if you're going to be happy, what you need to do is assemble all around your selfish desires, make everything just the way you want it, your dream house, your trophy spouse, your ideal job, and all the rest. But the truth is, if we got it all, we'd only be more depressed and more angry because all those outward advantages would only mock the sadness we have within. For life does not flow from outside in, it flows from the inside out. We need our hearts to be continuously filled with the ever fresh life of Christ by faith in the gospel, in the word of God. Jesus said this, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of this heart will flow, living, will flow rivers of living water. We'll lose our way in the journey of life 
if we don't keep coming to Jesus and drinking in his acceptance, his forgiveness, his promises, and his love. Everything else flows out from the deep in here. Your heart has a a hunger, a thirst that only Christ can satisfy. And he can satisfy it to the overflowing freely for you. Come as you are. Come moment by moment. Drink him in. Fill your heart with the love of Jesus for sinful people by believing the gospel moment by moment. As we draw the love we crave from Jesus, it flows out in healing throughout our entire beings. Now, keeping the heart consists of preserving and protecting it. This must be done with all vigilance, that is, constant watchfulness. If you're the parent of a small child, you keep an eye on them to meet their needs, but you keep also an eye out for them to protect them from danger. The same is true if you're keeping a garden. You preserve the plants by watering and fertilizing and pruning them, but you also protect the plants from weeds, rodents, and disease. Keeping means preserving and protecting, looking inward and outward, ensuring soundness and safety. Keeping the heart demands both. The heart is like a musical instrument that if neglected can fall out of tune. It needs to stay in sync with our Savior. For sin is crouching at the door to undo what God has done and bring our hearts out of sync with him. Our hearts are preserved when we feed upon God's word. The Bible says all scriptures breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. That ministry takes place when we meditate upon God's word. To delight is in the law of the Lord and the godly righteous person meditates on it day and night. We store up the word of God in our heart so that we may not sin against God. Reading is one thing, but meditating is quite another. It is how you absorb the truths of the scripture. For it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. The word of God is heart healthy food. It keeps us from being unfruitful, ineffective, and weak. The person who meditates and memorizes the scripture is the one who is more and more able to protect himself from attack. The devil lies to us. The heart is deceitful. Yet a person filled with the word of God, standing in faith upon the promises of God, has guarded his heart. His heart will go on, preserved. And just as we look inwardly to protect the heart's soundness, we Watch outwardly to protect the heart's safety. We have an enemy of our souls with many minions. There are traps laid for us like a spider spawns webs. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil, in the heavenly places. And so we must wield the sword of the Spirit to stand and not fall. 
we must guard our hearts against the inevitable daily temptations that arise from our hearts and those that arise from the world. We do not love the world or the things in the world. That is, the system of godless thinking is not something that we subscribe to or that we hold to, but we desire to do the will of God. He who abides in the will of God lives forever. We are sheep among wolves, beloved, but we strive for innocence and avoid being naive. We're not naive about who we are in the pull of the flesh and the things of the world. We resist the devil and his seductions because we watch and pray. Jesus says, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. That is why we pray in the Lord's Prayer, lead us not into temptation. And so we are aware and vigilant, and we ask the Lord for his help in preserving and protecting our own hearts. The price of freedom, it has been said, is eternal vigilance. In this age, the lion and the calf may lay down together, but the calf won't get much sleep. The calf would have to sleep with one eye open. Steve Green, the great singer who sang six years with Bill and Gloria Gaither, tells about getting to know some of the work crews in the large auditoriums where their concerts were held. The Gaithers prefer concerts in the round, which means extra work for the riggers who walk four-inch rafters, often a hundred feet above a concrete floor to hang sound speakers and spotlights. For such work, understandably, they're very well paid. But many of them are not bothered by walking on a four-inch beam a hundred feet over a concrete floor. What they're bothered by is jobs in buildings that had false ceilings, acoustical tile slung just a couple of feet below the rafters, but tiles that are not strong enough to hold a person. That person would fall right through. They were still high in the air, and if they slipped, their weight would smash right through the flimsy tile. But their minds seemed to play tricks on them, lulling them into carelessness. Satan's business is not so much scaring us to death, but persuading us that the danger of a spiritual fall is minimal. No wonder Peter advised us, to resist him, standing firm in the faith. 1 Peter 5, 9. <clears throat> now, one thing is very important. You must be the umpire of your own heart. Not every thought you think is your thought. Not every thought you think is something that originated with you. The enemy of our souls does insinuate thoughts into our hearts. And the real you is the filter. You must say no to some of your own thoughts and yes to others. You must be the judge and you must use the yardstick of the word of God to do so. You are the, emp the umpire. You must step back with the help of the Holy Spirit, think about what you were thinking. What is on your mind? How have you been thinking? Reject that which does not square with Scripture and its glorious principles. Realize how far you have fallen, perhaps, in your thoughts. How out of step you have become. 
perhaps a prisoner of your own thoughts. Realize how you've been walking in the flesh and how you have not been keeping in step with the Spirit. Why did Solomon tell his son or his student, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life? It is because, as Adrian Rogers once said, the majesty of the thought life. It is the thought life that controls the rest of life. You tell me what you think, and I'll tell you how you live. It's the thought life that controls you. The thought life is on the throne. What you think is what you are. Your attitudes come from your thoughts. Your actions come from there. And your achievements flow from your actions. There is a familiar saw that says this, sow a thought, reap an action. Sow an action, reap a habit. Sow a habit, reap a character. Sow a character, reap a destiny. It all begins with the thought life, the heart. And so the heart is not tangential. The thought life, it's fundamental. It's so fundamental that one day God destroyed an entire civilization for what reason? They had heart trouble. God destroyed them for that. Reading from Genesis chapter 6 verses 5 through 7. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things, and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. Can you imagine? Why? Why did this happen? Because of the thoughts of human hearts. The heart of the human problem is the problem of the human heart. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be day in the days in the coming of the Son of Man. We're still having the same problems that they had back then, the thoughts of men's hearts, the attitudes, the actions, and the achievements that result therefrom. Conversely, much better news, when God gets ready to change a person, when God gets ready to use a person, mold a person, make a person, motivate a person, how does he do it? He does it by changing how that person thinks. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. How does God transform us? By changing the thoughts of our heart. When God is in the heart, when a person thinks right, he then lives right and does right, when God is ignored, the person thinks wrong, does wrong, and lives wrong. A heart is the control center, and a battle rages for the control of the heart. And no wonder the devil battles for the mind. No wonder the Lord Jesus Christ wants us to present our bodies to him, including our minds, that he might transform us. That's the majesty of the thought life. Be careful. Guard your heart. How important it is that we learn to keep our hearts, especially at a time like this. You have to be careful what comes into your mind because you have to think pure thoughts. In this day and age, a sewer pipe 
has broken on our nation. Can you imagine the harm that $9 billion of pornography has done to our nation? We're getting immune to it. What was horrible yesterday is acceptable today and has become a stepping stone for something worse tomorrow. Proverbs says, can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burned? There's a familiar little hymn. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Oh, be careful, little ears, what you hear. There's a father up above looking down in tender love. Now, there are people who will tell you that what you see doesn't affect you. But if that's true, tell me why a corporation will spend more than $5 million for less than a minute ad on the Super Bowl if they don't believe what a person sees will affect them and what a person sees will change them in some manner. Of course it will. You let that come in your mind, you let that come in your heart, it usually goes out in some manner. You've got to deal with everything that comes to you. You be the umpire, and the book that you use as the umpire is the word of God. Whatever is inconsistent, or violative of the word of God, reject. You must be the umpire of your heart. And Jesus must be the first love of our hearts. Unless God is central in our life, we'll find more and more frustration, more and more emptiness. You know, basically the problem of humanity is disordered loves. We love certain things. We love our children. We love our country. We love fried clams in New England. We love lots of things. There's nothing wrong with loving those things. But our loves become disordered unless we love God above all those other things. That's why the scripture says, love the Lord your God with all your heart. Disordered loves. And you think about that. Martin Luther had a great battle with disordered loves. He went from sin, from living a life of sin to a life of devotion to God. He became a monk in an Augustinian order. But he realized something very seductive, that when he did good things, when he preached and prayed and gave to the poor, that he had mixed motive, that he did those things because he loved them and he felt good doing them. And he didn't do them out of a pure heart. All his motives were mixed. He gave to the poor not because he loved them so much, but because he felt good giving them, giving them something, you see. And so sometimes we can do great things, but really have a motive of just doing them for ourselves, even though they're for others. Augustine knew about this and said that we're curved in on ourselves. And so Luther used to go to his father confessor in the monastery and pray for forgiveness. And soon uh, his list of confessions uh, became something of six hours a day. He was driving himself crazy. But then he finally saw something. Other people may say, well, this is the way, do this. This is the way, do this. This is the way, don't do that. 
But Jesus said one thing. He said, I am the way. Jesus doesn't say, I blaze the way. I point you to the way. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He lived the life that we need to live. And he died the death that we needed to die. He is the way to life, you see. And it is him, if we love him above everything else, everything else will fall into proper order and proper place. We realize how much he loves us and our hearts are just effervescing with love for him and on all other loves are subordinate. But then we'll be able to handle those other loves in a right way. Only when money is second will you make wise financial decisions when you put Jesus first. Only when marriage is second and Jesus is first will you make good choices of who to marry. And only when Jesus is first and your work and children are second will your heart be healed and will you be wise. We need to get the gospel in our hearts. It doesn't happen overnight most times. The Bible says the path of the righteous is like the first gleam of dawn, shining ever brighter till the full light of day. Love is the reason Jesus went through what he did. Love for us, beloved. Look at that love until it changes your loves. People are like icebergs. And I don't mean to say that everybody is cold, but people are like icebergs because we only see the tip. So to speak, no matter who it is we encounter or who we think we know best, most of us is below the surface, hidden from view, but so very instrumental in how the person interacts with others in the world. What is buried in your heart is not always on your mind. My children will remember those Saturday mornings in summer when I would call out for weeders and everybody would run and scatter. <laughs> it was time for the unpleasant task of weeding the flower beds at home. One thing weeds never do is sleep, especially in summer. They don't need any tending to proliferate. In fact, it is the good plants that need to be tended to produce good fruit or flower. We all know that you will not have any success in dealing with weeds unless you get them at the root, below the surface. Since every issue in life is a reflection of what is in our hearts, we need to learn how to go from the fruit to the root. Otherwise, we're simply masking symptoms, but not getting to the heart of the matter. The disease of sin in its multifaceted forms. Noxious weeds are the fruit of hidden roots. We are commanded in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves. We are to judge ourselves. We are to ask the Lord to help us to examine our hearts. Self-inquiry is the thing. Growth in grace comes through biblical self-examination, which is only done with the word of God and only done with God. But we don't become introspective so that we become morbid and depressed. We go to God, like David. Who can discern his errors, he said, 
forgive my hidden faults. What a beautiful prayer. Forgive my hidden faults. Lord, I have faults, I have sins that I'm largely unaware of. Please forgive me of those too. David is imploring God to show him and cleanse him of his secret faults. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there's some grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. And so our hearts, we preserve with the word of God, we protect with the sword of the Spirit, and we ask the Lord to fill us with his light, with his life. The lamp of the Lord searches the spirit of a man. It searches out his inmost being. And when God exposes those hidden roots to us, we don't despair, but we repent and place our faith in Christ as the way, the one who has won righteousness for us. Can you imagine? Repentance is so freeing because we don't have to have it all together. We seek the Lord, seek to do well, but if as and when we fail, we seek his cleansing and we are restored. God is a good God that can't be emphasized enough. But remember this, the heart of the matter is always a matter of the heart. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we echo the statement made down through the ages that hard work is hard work. Help us, Lord, fill our hearts with you. And help us, Lord, to walk with you, to live with you, and to be the umpire of our hearts by your help and aid. To say no to some of those thoughts, to say yes to those that are God-honoring, and help us to be Christ-centered, Christ-exalting, and joyful, joyful knowing that you have done it all. You have paid it all, all, all means all. In Christ's name, amen.
And now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. May God bless you and keep you this day. May you have a joyous Lord's Day. Hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.